Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Great book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah mean, meaning whom God launches forth. And so it is. We're talking about the severe sins of the house of Judah in this particular chapter. Chapter 17, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father. And it reads, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is, a, it is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. First of all, no, not my altar, your altar, meaning an altar of idolatry. And what is this iron pen? It's a chisel. I mean, it is, their old hearts are as hard as a rock to do sin. And certainly it takes that chisel with a diamond point to write what God might have them to say. That's the sin. It's much and it runs deep. Verse 2, whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills, their pagan shrines and all their ways of worshiping as the heathen do. You, you drag people off. You chase uh, bunnies quick like a rabbit and you roll fertility eggs on the high Passover day of Christianity. Verse 3. O oh, my mountain, that's to say, O oh, my nation, in the field I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil and by high places for sin throughout all by borders. Now, bear in mind what's happening here. The king of Babylon is coming. He says, I'm going to turn it over to, I'm going to turn it all over to them. And you want to remember this when the king of Babylon of the end times comes. God will turn this geographical location over to him. And it will come to pass as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that Satan will stand in the holy place claiming to be God. That's the son of perdition. Verse 4. And thou, even thyself, shall discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. That should remind you as one of God's elect of the great song of Moses. And so it is. Do, do you remember it? It's quoted quite often, the song that the overcomers will sing as it's written in Revelation 15, when Christ at the second advent returns, they will sing this song of Moses. It's how we overcome. Verse 22 of 32nd chapter of the great book of Deuteronomy. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischief upon them. I will send mine arrows upon them. You don't want to get on the bad side of our Father. There comes a time when his wrath is poured out that the sinners will pay. That is to say, well, what kind of sin are we talking about? False religion. Not paying attention to the letter that our Father has sent to us. His, he has feelings. And one of his feelings is anger. Call it righteous indignation if you like, but he has plenty of it. And he has a right to because he said, you, you might as well chisel it in rock. That's how their hearts are. Verse 5, to continue, back in chapter 17. Thus saith the Lord, 
cursed be the man. This word in the Hebrew manuscripts is gebar. Okay. Gebar, that trusteth in man and make of flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Who, who wants to build his own salvation is to trust some person that claims to be godly, that comes up with different religions. Let me go there and worship and leave off the Word of God. The Word of God is the only solid foundation you're ever going to find in this world. In this world age or any earth age to come, do you know the only thing that survives other than your works of this earth age? It's the Word of God. As Mark 13 so declares, the Word of God shall never change. It will be the same as it was in the first earth age, this one, and the one to come. So stay solid on the rock. Christ was that rock. He is that Word. It became flesh and walked among us. Verse 6, to continue. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited, I mean in the desert. Do, do you know what an old heath bush is? It's an old bush that is so scrawny, and the wild goats come off and pick every leaf off of it that comes, kind of like the juniper and the goats. And um, the word heath means naked. Why? Because it, it's, it's eaten up. What he's saying is you're going to be naked. They're going to pick at you and pull at you, and, and you're going to be like away from water, out in a dry land starved of truth, where there's no truth among them, and that's the way you're going to be. And na naturally this heath being the, the word meaning naked, is um, when, when you arrive, if you make heaven, the linen you wear, according to Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 and 7, is made up from your, it's fine linen woven from your righteous acts in this, genera in this um, uh, earth age. If you have no righteous acts, let me ask you a question, what are you going to wear? You're going to be like the heath, naked. So therefore, you want to stay with our Father. You don't want to go to a dry, barren place that is barren of the Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but you want to go where you can absorb that truth of God's Word, whereby um, your heart is not hardened to following the Word of God. Verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. That says it all, my friend. Do you see how simple God's Word is? When they strive and chase and wonder and look and search in, the, in all sorts of heathenistic rituals and, and uh, listen to man, it's as blessed as the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. And so it is that our Father takes care of His own and you are His own when you stay with his word. You're not naked. You're not void of truth. You are in a plush, lush land that flows with the living water, and that living water is Christ. Verse 8, For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, um, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. In other words, when you, are, when you are with the Father and in the Father, you are planted by that stream that flows from the very altar of God that you read of in the book of Ezekiel and, and the book of Revelation, that living water that flows from the very altar of God that feeds you with truth, with the pasture that you truly need to know how to, to um, survive in any time of drought of truth, or when people try to mislead, or when troubles come upon the world. God's going to take care of his own. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord.
You know, uh, uh, this reminds me of the first chapter of the great book of Psalms. Psalms 1, I'm going to read a couple, three verses. Just listen to it here. Verse 1 reads, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2, But his delight is the law of the Lord. That's his word. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. He continues growing in that word of God, knowing the difference between laws, statutes, and ordinances, where he can rightly discern the word of God. Verse 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's the way you want to be. It's so simple. All you have to do is love the Lord and stay in his word. He will strengthen you. He will heal you. He will lead you on. You, do you understand what the, probably the most beautiful part of that is? Stop thinking about self for a moment. And think with those attributes within yourself, Think how precious you are to other people that are hurting and are lost. You don't even have to say anything. They can feel that Holy Spirit that is in you. And that's why God chooses his elect. Chose them in the first earth age. That through that Holy Spirit, through that well-watered, even in terrible drought times, as we're in right now, then you can be a blessing to others it is wonderful to be blessed yourself, but God's elect have a purpose, and it is to others, compassion upon them. You are not responsible for anything other than seeing that the truth goes forth. What they do with it, that's up to them. Now, returning to the 17th chapter of the great book of Jeremiah, let's go with the next verse, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? Uh, this word desperately is, is uh, sick, unto death, sick unto death. Death spiritually if you're not careful. The heart, if you listen to your, the, that is your mind, is what it truly translates. And um, if it's like a rock, then you're very difficult to deal with. Probably nobody can tell you anything. I wonder if God can. That's what's important through his word, through his letter that he's written to you. Can you hear him when he speaks through that word? Do you want to be that little old heath, naked bush that everything that comes along picks at until it's stripped, clean, bare? Or do you want to be that lush tree by, in the living water with roots founded in truth, whereby it's a blessing to all that come by and give shade to troubled people. Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I know what you're thinking. I try the reins, your very emotions, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. In other words, God is going to fairly judge everyone. If you do good, he's going to bless you good. If you do bad, he's going to allow the world to take you over, strip another few leaves off, and gradually let you wilt into that heath bush, a naked bush, no hope and nothing to look forward to. I, I do not understand why people would want to go there when you have the living God. Verse 11, he gives an analogy. Listen up. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right, he's a crook, shall, have, shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool. Now, this takes a little bit of translating and a little bit of understanding. A partridge will steal eggs from other birds, 
and hatch them out, sit on them, nurture them. Let's say what God is saying here, let's say she goes over and gets some duck eggs. And she, along with one or two of her own, and she hatches them out. And pretty soon the duck looks around and come, becomes aware when he gets a little knowledge and age on himself, hey, I'm not a partridge, I'm a duck. And with all the work the partridge has done, they leave her. It is with a man with ill-gotten gains. He thinks he's got it made and he sit back to enjoy the fruits. They leave him, I mean, bang, they're gone. Why? Don't go the way of the partridge. Do what's right. God had just said, hey, I'll reward whatever. If you do good, I'm going to reward you good. If you do bad, hey, here comes the chisel. You don't want to be a partridge. Verse 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Well, whose throne is that? Well, it isn't the one in verse 1 where it says your altar. This is the altar of the living God. And it is the only glorious high throne. And he alone sits on it. In, in both as Yahweh, the Savior, the, the Lord of all, and Yeshua, God's own saving um, attributes. Verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee, shall be ashamed. And they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the, found, the fountain of living waters. In other words, if you want to be that lush tree <clears throat> planted by that living water, there's only one place it comes from. Again, I, I want to remind you again, in the book of Ezekiel, in the, in the millennium uh, chapters, as well as, as in the great book of Revelation, the final, the water streams from the very throne itself, and it's a living water that feeds all. And do you know something? It's there for you to partake of today. If you want to absorb that living water, the stream flows through this word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you are blessed. When you produce for God, he will produce for you. When you turn away from God, he will turn away from you. That's only fair, and that's the way it is. <clears throat> Many, if you're not careful in this final generation, might turn away thinking you're turning to him, when really you're turning away to false teachings, to a false Christ. You see, this is right before the king of Babylon came, and he's preparing the people's mind to be able to ascertain what's going down, where you should be, what you should know, and who you should believe. You can always believe God. You cannot always believe man. Some men, as, as it's said before, if you listen to a geber, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. <clears throat> Verse 14 to continue. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For thou art my praise. And that's how it should be. Do you need a healing, and do you need him to heal your mind? Do you need him to give you stability? Well, don't be shy. Ask him. What he, there are many different healings besides healing for help, for knowledge, for wisdom, for, for guidance, for stability, uh, to, to, to assist you in being a better person. Uh, talk to him. He loves you. And when you talk to him and you're dedicated to him, you're going to, that living water is going to shower you with both the early and the latter rains of truth in this beautiful, wonderful word of God. Verse 15, Behold, or you look here, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? 
Let it come now. This is said in irony. In other words, if you think there, if he's real, if you think there's really a God, then let him bring it on. Let him strike me down right now. Oh, man, what a dangerous thing to say. Because I guarantee you, he will do it. Father always, I do mean always, keeps his word. It may take a month, it may take a couple of months, but that person is going to get it big time. Verse 16, as for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which come out of my lips was right before thee. When you, well, how can you know for sure that what comes out of your lips is right if you're teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and it is God doing the talking and not some man? 17. Be not a terror unto me. <clears throat> Thou art my hope in the day of evil. That, that is the only hope we have. Don't, don't, um, what it's saying here is don't leave me alone. And he won't. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You know, one of the greatest signs of weakness in man or woman is for them to think they're all alone. When you've got him right with you with the promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's why it kind of hurts me when I get a letter or a question from someone that will say, I'm all alone. No, you're not. Never leave you, he will never forsake you. As long as you are with him, he is with you. You leave him, he will leave you. Then you can be alone. But as long as you're trying, as long as you're sticking with the word, you are never alone. Verse 18. Let them be confounded that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Don't let me become confused. Let them be dismayed. Let them fall. But let not me be dismayed. Don't let me fall. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction. And so it is. This, is, this should remind you of, of chapter 18 where God said concerning that old harlot that follows away and goes after God, goes away from God's word. <clears throat> the great city Babylon, so double her cup to her, double it. Boy, is she going to get punished. What a time to, to stick with God's word and escape all that. Verse 19, Thus saith the Lord unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. This is the properties, and it means a, a, a gate is usually where judgment is brought forth. 20, and say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Ye kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that enter in by these gates. 21, thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, this means to your soul, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Don't you go bringing some false teaching in here. Don't you go swearing by any false religions. Not in God's house. Don't let anything um, common, that is to say of the world, that uh, into God's house, keep it straight. Keep true teaching. Keep the living water. He just told you what it was. 22. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do you any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. In these end times, I'd like for you to study every day. That's why we broadcast every day. Because in this time, you need it always have to do a good work. Don't do bad work and do not bring it into the house of God. 23. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff that they might be, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. 
they, they wouldn't study at all. This is why that instruction from God is the stability that you need in these end times. The word of God strengthens you. He will make your day. But you have to study. Why? Well, what does study mean? Reading his letter that he sent to you, telling you how to confront any situation that Satan might throw at you and come out the winner because in Christ's name we have victory over all of our enemies. 24. And it shall come to pass if you diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of this city or the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day, make it holy, to do no work therein. Don't you work some heathenistic work around here. Don't you go out here in the hilltops chasing bunnies, quick like a rabbit, or rolling fertility eggs, bringing those heathen practices into the church of God. 25. Then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses. They and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. And certainly, ultimately, at the end of time, so it shall be, that it shall reign forever. That's a little ways down the road. What he's saying in is, if you obey me, if you study my word, if you put rulers politically and otherwise over you according to my advice, according to my word, It'll be good with you forever, because God's word is forever. It is the eternity, <clears throat> but it is up to you. If you do God's way and God's work, and you place these proper ones, not as Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4 would say, put children minds over you in the end times especially, but true, rightful, I mean leaders, leaders Believing in God, knowing our Father, following Him, then you will be blessed indeed. Forever, not just a little while, forever. 26, and they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about uh, Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin and from the plain and from the mountains and from the south bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, that's their love now, and meat offerings and incense and bringing sacrifices of praise unto the house of the Lord. That praise is what he really wants. He does not want your burnt offerings. Christ was a sacrifice for one and all times. It is sacrilegious anymore to do a blood offering when Christ shed his blood that we could have forgiveness of sins. And certainly, what he's saying is, is pay attention. Do you want to live in a, as, as an old naked bush out in the desert, starving for truth, starving for water, starving for attention? Or do you want my blessings? It's up to you. That's what God is telling you. It's your choice. You can either come to me as verse 7 stated, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, in whose hope the Lord is. That if you want to put your hope in something, put it in him. And, and, um, and trust in him. And, and have that flowing water and the blessings rather than that sterile, old, dried up bush and like some foolish partridge that hatches somebody else's eggs or steals them, and then they'll leave, him, leave her high and dry. She's got nothing. You don't want that. Cultivate your own truths from God's Word and stick with it. Never, never detour from the very path that God would lead you and leave it up to our Father to do the leading. Verse 27. But if you will not hearken to me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden 
even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. No one can do it. Not, uh, this should remind you of the time Christ would say to his disciples when they would say, Jesus, look at the buildings. He said, there's a day coming at the end when there won't be one stone standing atop another. That's after the Antichrist comes there. You start letting things in at that gate that detour from the truth of God's word and allow them to take root. And, and um, incidentally, we talk about Sabbaths and high Sabbaths. Uh, what are we really talking about? As a Christian, what does that mean to you? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Do you not know who became our Sabbath? Do you not know who became our high Sabbath? That is to say, Passover. By Passover, it means in him that that is evil, that that is the heath bush, that that is not desired must pass over you. If it does come through, he will give you the strength and the knowledge and the wisdom to take care of business. God trusts his own. He trusts you when you partake of his word. He is always fair. As that one verse said, I give according to what you do and what you believe and where you come from. So you can always trust him. Therefore, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. It's that simple. God's word is not difficult. Trust in him and be blessed. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. We have a judge. It's our father. He does not need your help. You do have the right for spiritual discernment. That's a gift from God. Use it and know who you should listen to and who you should not. Always, if you want to listen to where the blessings come from, blessed is the man or woman or child that trusts in God. It's that simple. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. And uh, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, got a prayer request? We can do away with the number and the address. You don't need it. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He does. Let him know. Talk to him. But most of all, from you, he wants your love. Let him know you love him and ask for whatever it is that you need to strengthen yourself and mainly that pray that you'll be a blessing to other people. That gets God's attention in a hurry. It shows that you have compassion and that most likely you're one of his elect. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen.
Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Susan from Alabama. Will you please explain the difference between the six-day creation and the eighth-day creation in regards to DNA? They all have different DNA. Everybody does. God created all of the peoples the way he wanted them. He created every race on the sixth day other than Eth Ha'adam. He created Eth Ha'adam, that's the Hebrew terminology, for the man through which Christ would come on the eighth day. They each had their own individual DNA. Each had their own individual soul. Each had their own um, um, selves, that is their soul, to think for themselves, to decide for themselves. When God created the races, he looked on the sixth day at the end of it, and it was good. So, and, and, and so it is. They all had different DNA. Why? God made everybody unique. Why? Because he wanted a person just like that. He wants you to love him. Everyone is unique. Connie from Florida. I have heard Pastor Murray say that when you die, your soul immediately goes to be with the Father. I am confused because I thought we had to wait until Judgment Day and for it to determine where our soul goes. Well, it, it goes to paradise. That's where God is, and it goes there for judgment. God is the God of the living, the last verses of chapter 8, the great book of St. John. Not the dead. He's the judge of the living. They are in paradise, very much alive. And there is a gulf, though, in the middle, as it is written in Luke chapter 16, of that paradise. The good people that overcome are on the right side of paradise, and the bad are on the left side because they choose the left way to go. And so it is. God is the judge, and he does it just right. So uh, there you have it. But we still have the millennium, period. For there are some innocents that never had an opportunity to learn the truth. They went to some flyaway doctrine and thought it was right. And now they're going to learn the truth before Satan, while Satan's locked away for a thousand years, and then released, and then see what they do. Then comes the final judgment, the lake of fire, the great white throne judgment, like you say. Uh, Connie from Florida. I have heard past... We got that, didn't we? Okay, Joe from Kentucky. When Satan comes to earth, will we be in a spiritual body or a flesh body? When Satan comes, we'll be in a flesh body. When Christ comes at the second advent, instantly, I mean as quick as you can wink, we're in spiritual bodies. That's a mystery that you do not want to be ignorant of, as it is written in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 2. Stella from Alabama. You used the word katabo. Please explain what it is and how to spell it. Well, katabo, check it out for yourself. You have a companion Bible, Appendix 146 will teach you more about it. What it means, it means to overthrow. It's a Hebrew word. It means to overthrow. It's a, it is it overthrow, and it has to do with when Satan was overthrown in the first earth age. And, and then the first earth age itself was overthrown. And certainly um, you, can, you can know, usually, if you take Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations. It's the catabo. I mean, I chose you even before that overthrow happened. Why? Because you were fighting against Satan then, and you're going to do it again, and he knows he can trust you to do that. Because you don't find Satan tempting, you find him to be an abomination. So usually, as a matter of fact, in another place you would find it written would be in Matthew chapter 13, verse 35, 36, and 7, where it says a mystery kept secret from the foundation of the world. Kept secret, this is the parable of the tares. Kept secret from the foundation, that's to say the catabole, the overthrow, so that people would know God brought man in the flesh, but Satan was the father 
the devil was the father of the tares, which is to say the Kenites. Jesus teaching it out bold and clear. Uh, from Tennessee, I'm not going to read the name, can I be forgiven for my sins of adultery? Adultery is not the unpardonable sin. Adultery is forgivable. And um, you, you take that up with the Father and mainly forgive yourself and know that when God forgives you, then that's the end of story. He says, I don't want to hear about it again. Think about it. Judy from Indiana. Where in the Bible does it say when you die, your spirit immediately goes to heaven? Well, in more places than one. Basically, let's mention New Testament, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 7 and 8. To be absent from this flesh body is to be present with the Lord. In other words, when the flesh dies, you're gone. You're out of here. And, and then in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, the minute this old clay pot breaks, the silver cord parts that holds your spirit body here, and it's gone, right back to the Father from whence it came. Robert from North Dakota, I'm confused. I heard you say that Satan and his angels weren't thrown out of heaven yet, but I also thought Jesus said that he saw Satan thrown out of heaven like a lightning bolt. No, you, you, you're you quoting from um, the book of Luke where God, Christ would say, I beheld Satan fall as a star from heaven. Okay, Coming down as a star as a child of God. Okay, So he's coming down from heaven, but that was future. And he was letting you know, don't worry about it because I give you power over all of your enemies. I give you power over the scorpions which Satan likes to use, as you read in Revelation chapter 9. Serpents, which Satan is, in Christ's name. So And so it is. that You have to rightly divide the word of God. Okay. You have to keep everything in its time sequence. Who is it written to? What is it talking about? What is the time? Is it prophecy or is it stating a fact historically? His, there is nothing new under the sun. And to be able to recognize uh, that God uses First uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. All those things in the past happened as an example of what will be at the end. In other words, we learn from the lessons of what happened there. If, um, if somebody played with strange fire, you know what happened to them in the past? First, the oldest two sons of Aaron, God killed them. They messed around with strange fire and wanted to take it to God's altar. That means to take heathenistic practices and try to bring them into God's house. He didn't like it. He killed them. So what, what you want to do is uh, to be pleasing to God and to um, uh, rightly divide that word and know what it means, okay, and who it applies to. Bruce from California. When the Antichrist arrives, will all the atheists believe he is the real Christ? Most likely. Most likely, uh, they may even call him by a different name. But he performs miracles like uh, Antichrist does, like making lightning come down from heaven. And that's going to be impressive to an atheist. It will be impressive to a lot of people. They will think he is supernatural. He's got to be Messiah. Well, he's not. Well, how do you know? From the Word. The Word makes it so clear a child can understand in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the false one comes first. The first one taken in the field in Matthew 24. You've heard a lot of sermons preached. I want to be that first one taken. And they show their ignorance of God's Word, not rightly dividing it, because the first one taken is taken by Antichrist. You want to preach a sermon on... Praise God, I want to be taken by Antichrist. I want to fly right away into his little buggy. But it happens. People do teach it. Lin uh, Linda from Florida. What does it mean, the first shall be last and the last shall be first? Those that were first chosen in the last earth age shall be last to live, be born of woman in this earth age, because they must stand against Satan. All down through the years, there was a remnant 
as Romans 11 stipulates, that brought the word forth. But at the end, the last is the generation of God's elect that make that stand against the Antichrist. Why did they have to be born at the end? Because that's when the Antichrist comes. Tim from Tennessee. When Jesus died on the cross for us and they put him in the tomb, then three days later when they went back, his whole body was gone. Did this whole body enter into heaven or just his spirit? Thank you. Have you ever heard of the Mount of Transfiguration? Why, and as it is written in Matthew chapter 11 that Christ went there with three witnesses and Moses and Elijah joined him in transfigured bodies. They shined like the heavens. It was to let people know that he would be transfigured, that his body would not be left here. Why? Well, can you imagine if his body had not risen transfigured also, how many people do you think would believe in the resurrection? If his body's laying there, how are we going to document that he resurrected? It would be a lot more difficult. So he was transfigured, so there would be no opportunity for anyone to say he did not resurrect. Uh, the second chapter of Acts makes that very clear that even David himself, his body decomposed in the earth, but Christ didn't. Uh, Kathy from Georgia, where, what is the scripture that I could give someone to help them feel at peace and not to be afraid? I always like to use 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. But nothing, un everything that happens to you happens to about everybody. Do you know how to cut it? Well, you should. God will, God will never test you more than you can handle. And he will always, this is the beauty of it, he will always show you a way out. Use this. Always think for yourself. You know, you can get advice if you want to, but when it comes down to the final, you sort it out and you think for yourself. That's what this ministry is about, is teaching people to think for themselves using God's word as the um, gauge thereof that you should go by to learn how to think for yourself, whereby you are judged by your own actions, your own uh, deeds, and not somebody else's. <clears throat> Quite frankly, excuse me, that's what you're going to answer for anyway, is your own deeds. Think for yourself. Rose from Ohio, can you lose your, lose your salvation through backsliding? How can you come back again? Thank you. You can certainly lose <clears throat> your, yourself away from God by backsliding. The salvation is always there because Christ did it. He doesn't fail, but you can. You can backslide until you fall so far away from his salvation you can go to hell. But how do you get back? It's real simple. You repent and mean it. Repent means to have a change of heart, a change of mind, and to be sorry for what you did, and to want to go back into the loving grace of trusting Almighty God through the Son, to have his blessings, to be in that fertile ground of a tree by the living water. And he'll say, welcome home. I love you. So you have to repent. John from Pennsylvania, when, when you command Satan to get out, is it okay to say it in your head, or is it better to say it out loud? You, you can say it in your head all right enough, but you don't want to forget the main part. You have to say, in Christ's name, because it is Christ that runs him out, not us. We don't do it. So you can say it silently if something negative is around you and ask Christ mentally in your mind to cast it out, to throw it away. He'll do it. And, um, but there's nothing wrong at the same time to make a strong stand as a Christian and cast it out if it's necessary. Um, people in pastorships have to do that occasionally. Betty from Georgia, where can I find... Mary's genealogy in the Bible. Only one place can you find Mary's genealogy. It's Luke chapter 3. 
Matthew chapter 1 is not Mary's genealogy. It is not Christ's genealogy. It is Christ's genealogy by adoption. For Joseph was his adopted father, not his blood father. Mary's genealogy is the blood of Christ from which he came. Mary's mother was of the tribe of Levi. And Mary's father was of the tribe of Judah. Therefore, the priesthood and the king line came together in that um, uh, through Mary's parents, whereby Christ himself is born of the order after Melchizedek, king and priest. That's why he is king of kings and lord of lords, priest of priests. Lee, for, Lee Ann from South Carolina. What is the unpardonable sin? The unpardonable sin you can read of um, in the great chapter, uh, Luke, the great 12th chapter, in verse 10, where it stipulates that if you're one of God's elect, when you're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, if you refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through you, that's unpardonable. I mean, I'm, I, it was not going to happen. The God's elect are ready. John from Michigan. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, how does this coincide with the beginning of the nations in the six-day creation? I appreciate all your hard work. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We appreciate you. You need to check out the translations. Even poor old Schofield got this one right. He caught the fact that the word isn't, he made all of the same blood. He made all of the same lump of clay into the, to the uh, people that they were. So uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, the word blood is not in the manuscripts. It's clay, autumn, the autumn itself. He made all from. This is why in, in um, let me think real quickly, in Romans chapter 9, it says God can take the same lump of clay and he can form a flower vase or he can make a chamber pot out of the same lump of clay. Okay, And this is when he was speaking of Esau and, and Jacob and also of Pharaoh. He made us all from the same lump of clay. Danny from Rhode Island, can I anoint someone myself or does that need to be done by someone in the church? Well, if you're one of God's elect, you are the church. And you have every right to, if you're a Christian and you're a believing Christian and you trust God and you understand what the oil symbolizes and what it's for, you go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, Christ, the word itself, means the anointed one. Ellen from Connecticut. At the end of Mark 16, 18, what was Jesus referring to? Any deadly thing? Thank you. If you are one of God's elect, you can pick up serpents or you can drink any deadly thing and it will not harm you. What does that mean? It is an idiom, a metaphor, a figure of speech. What it means is if you are truly loved of God, who is Satan? He's the serpent. Don't go out here and pick up some rattlesnake. Okay, They haven't read the Bible. They'll bite you. Okay, Unless you're a snake charmer. And snake charming is not part of God's religion. And to drink anything means that your character was, will withstand any opposition, any ridicule. And so it is. You be true to the word of God and you can fulfill those things. But don't go drinking poison. Your little old flesh body will curl up and die. Okay? But if you're living right, there's nobody can condemn you. Okay? They may try. But then, so be it. That that is natural is natural and that that is of God is of Almighty God. God created us the way we are, natural. Brenda from Alabama. <clears throat> is hell forever? Do people that go to hell burn forever and ever? Well, if you take a piece of paper and you burn it and it turns to ashes, it's ashes forever and ever. <clears throat> and um, it, God does not intend to have a heaven 
that we have a big lake and there's millions of people out in that lake screaming and burning and severe torture and pain and that's heaven that's not the heaven I want to go to and that's not the heaven our father has okay so therefore end of story to be blotted out that's what it means when God is through with you you are blotted out and and you know something to be blotted out or to remove from the book of life means you're not in the land of the living anymore, spiritually and or otherwise. Do you know something? Do you know why there are no tears shed in heaven? When you're blotted out, nobody can even remember you. So there's nothing to feel sorry about. You don't exist. And you could almost say, although incorrectly, you never existed as far as the memory is concerned. At that time, it will be blotted. Shannon from Oregon, when the first people died, did they become angels? Do we become angels when we die, or do we still remain God's children? Both. Angels are God's children. They're just people in spiritual bodies. Uh, Tim from Georgia, what is the difference between a tithe and an offering? Uh, well, the word tithe means 10%. An offering means a love offering, and uh, many people on fixed incomes, that's all they can afford. Why? They would have no income. Okay, hey, we're out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. It makes his day when you let him know that you love him. He sent you this letter, and when you study it, it does make his day. You're absorbing, and he's going to bless you for it. You bless God, he will always bless you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important though, you listen to me. You listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to finish promises of, or God's promises. You know, they're important. And basically, this seventh chapter of Acts, in which we begin in the last lecture, really Stephen, that word meaning crown, and he being one of seven that was picked back in chapter six of this book of Acts, it tells you on the third level that he is symbolic of the crown and 